Welcome to our 2020 King Holiday Signature Event, Beloved Community Talks. Thank you for joining us for these courageous conversations as we explore systemic racism and the actions required to end it. We invite you to share this live stream event on your social media platforms. Our moderator for tonight's courageous conversations, Jamil Smith, senior writer, Rolling Stone Magazine. Our first conversation, Understanding Systemic Racism and Intersectionality. We will take an in-depth look on how racism is interwoven in the very fabric of our nation and understand the root causes of systemic racism. Our conversationalists for this segment include Dina Hayes Green, co-founder and managing director, Racial Equality Institute, LLC, and Dr. Jacqueline Badalora, St. Xavier University, author, Birth of a White Nation, the invention of white people and its relevance. This evening, we will explore the origins and impacts of systemic racism in America, and then move to examining the role that each of us can play in disrupting and changing conditions that keep us from actualizing Dr. King's vision for the beloved community. Without further ado, uh, let me first introduce our, uh, our first conversation guests. Uh, number one would be Dr. Jackie Badalora. Thanks, Jamil. Thank Great you. To be here. And last but not least, Dina Hayes Green. Uh, so, Dina, I'm going to start with you. Okay. In his book, Why We Can't Wait, Dr. King writes, quote, for too long the depth of racism in America, American life, has been underestimated. The surgery to extract it, it is, necess it is necessarily complex and detailed. As a beginning, it is important to x-ray our history and reveal the full extent of the disease. Now we have a lot of medical metaphors there, but I wanna ask you, it only makes sense that we cannot root out this kind of institutional hatred and inequality without truly knowing how deep the roots go. Why, in your view, does it matter so much that we conduct this surgery that Dr. King is talking about? I think without that, we don't know why we're where we're at. Mm -hmm. um, two of my um, mentors, uh, Michael Bird and Dr. Linda Clayton, laid out a chronology of the history of race in this country, and they have it broken down into these chronological periods. From 1619 to 1865, that's 246 years, 62% of our experience in the United States has been under chattel slavery. Mm -hmm. So we're not just oppressing and um, brutalizing black people, the genocide against Native Americans, but we're building a nation. We're establishing every major institution in this country, its orientations, its uh, epistemology, all of its ways of being. Then we have another 100 years of Jim Crow from 19, 1865 to 1965, 25% of our experience. So out of 400 years, we have spent 346 years, 87% of our experience in a whites only nation. Mm -hmm. And so it is, it is impossible then to uproot that without that examination and not just the history of the oppression of people of color, but what was going on in this nation at the time. But Jackie, so many people tell us to just get over it. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, they say, well, you know, this is such, these so many advances have happened. Uh, why aren't we moving on? And in that light, I wanna you know, ask you, how does systemic racism perpetuate white advantage? I mean, if this is something that you examined in your book. Absolutely, well, first of all, the only people that could make such a statement that get over it, it's in the past, <laughs> um, is obviously pretty revealing in and of itself. And, and it reveals a problem that is, um, it is right in front of us. It's in, it's in our school districts. It's in the texts that our kids are given, the, the, um, the educational content that our children are held accountable for. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a version of history that whitewashes the stats that you just shared with us and, and um, erases the um, routine advantages that white people are conferred and have been conferred. And if we don't see that, 
as white people, um, we can ask that question, right? And so if our education system is continuing to give us this very distorted version of history, um, then, then we miss most of U.S. history. But, you know, your book is called Birth of a White Nation. And so in that respect, there are a lot of uh, people who are simply taught that this nation, you know, is for them. Or, or they are taught uh, simply that, you know, racial disadvantages um, essentially are, are, are minimized compared to what they actually are. Can you tell me a little bit about how institutional education uh, plays a role in this? Well, it does by... Um giving, like I said, a version of events that right. erases um, the structural advantages. One, one of the ones I like to use in my classrooms regular, because it's just an easy one to grab onto, um, when people want to say, well, you know, my, par my, my family didn't get any of that. We didn't hold slaves. Right. And so I find this one just a really good one. So as a matter of founding law, our founders, the first Congress of this country, determined that in order to naturalize a U.S. citizen, one had to be white. So above loving freedom, more important than the gifts, the education, the insights, the talents that you possess, they put whiteness first. Mm. For more than 150 years, you had to be white to naturalize in this country. And so that's just a wonderful example, I think, of structural advantage mm -hmm. conferred to white people, whether you want it or not, whether you asked for it or not, irrelevant. You got it. We get all kinds of structural advantages because they're baked in. That is systemic racism. I think, you know, we're taught often also that racism looks like or sounds like a certain thing. It sounds like a racial slur. It looks like a particular gesture. Dr. King stated, you know, that we miss the broader dimensions of the evil of racism when we ignore, quote, our nation was born in genocide when we embraced the doctrine that the original American, the Indian, was an inferior race. Can we talk a little bit about how, you know, that historic racism, that particular racism plays into this? Yes, and I think that's one of the things that keeps cross-racial movements from getting off the ground. Um, you know, this um, you know, s design, this concept, this construct of race and racism evolved. And, um, you know, as people come to this country, encounter people that are in their way, the plan for Native Americans largely was genocide. Mm -hmm. um, African Americans are providing, pro providing free labor. And so as Jacqueline was talking about, you know, in 1790, our first census says in order to be a citizen, you have to be white. So black and white were the sort of racial identities on the mm -hmm. census of the United States from 1790 to around 1840 or 1850. And so black and white anchor this race construct in the United States. Other people, as they come to this country or are brought to this country, it, they enter that field, you know, that race construct in relationship to black and white, not independent of it. And if we don't understand how we've been inserted, then it pits us against each other. Mm -hmm. Because to survive, you need to get as close to white as possible and as far away from black. And so when we play into that, it key, you know, um, <clears throat> we begin to compete with each other. Uh, people begin to distance themselves from race, period. Even the immigration movement isn't centering race as the barrier. Because if you start talking about race in this country, then you align yourself with black people who are having collectively the worst outcome in every system and institution in the United States. Mm. Today. Today. And but it, it also within that, we have to look at the evolving definition of whiteness. Absolutely. And so can you Indeed. tell yeah, both of you, uh, um, Jackie, I'll start with you on that. Sure. Can, can you talk a little bit about how that has expanded over the years and why? Yeah, well, if, if I may, I'd like to touch on sort of the inventive moment. Uh, um, okay. okay, so <laughs> colonial North America, um, prior to 1681, if you look in the legal record, there is not a single reference to a group of people called white people, not one. Um, people, were, people who became white were referenced as um, English and other freeborns, Christians, right. um, and the like, but you will not find a white person. And so the question becomes, well, why? Why would you go about inventing an entirely new group of humanity, right? Lawmakers are like the rest of us, and they don't tend to exert energy in things that require effort unless it's to serve a purpose. And so to divide the 99%, because we had 
we had shown the force that we can be when we are united through Bacon's Rebellion. Um, to divide the 99% from each other, we invented white people. And so we deployed all of these um, English indentured servants and uh, poor British, um, largely British people, mm -hmm. um, made them white to unite them and place them over and above persons of African descent. And so we divided the 99% from each other. So the first assertion of whiteness in law in colonial North America was um, a version of whiteness, of white people for the first time, that meant nothing more than divide and dominate. Mm -hmm. And then we see different versions of whiteness throughout um, different moments in US history, where we have, um, after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, when our country virtually doubled in size, and yesterday some people were Mexicans living in Mexico, and the next day there are Mexicans living in the US and they didn't move. And right. they were white by federal law and not white by state and local law. And then you have Irish Catholics um, who came in the midst of the t uh, potato famine who were white by federal law, white by state law, but not white at the local level. And then, one other example, <laughs> we have large numbers of Chinese men who came to pan for gold and build the most dangerous sections of the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, who were not white by virtue of federal law, um, not white by virtue of state law, and not white um, at the local level. So those are just um, some manifestations of, of non-whiteness and how whiteness interacts with different groups. Um, again, when you get into the details of the story to divide and dominate. Dana, how do we see that manifesting in policy today? Well, I think the un unmarking of white, so as you know, Jackie says, we've built a nation on whiteness and we made it invisible. Mm -hmm. So as I've been exploring all of our societies and associations and our curriculums and our methodologies and our approaches and all of our systems and institutions, they came from the experiences of a group of people who've come to be called white. And when you make it invisible, then it makes it very difficult for white people to see that every day they're having a racial experience. You know, mm -hmm. the American Medical Association, you have to be white to be a member. The American Bar Association is restricted to members of the white race. Um, I was talking to one of uh, the brilliant um, young interns that are helping out with this event um, from a historically black college and university. And, um, and he referred to the white university as a PWI, which it triggers me right away. So, you know, what is a PWI? It's a predominantly white institution. Right. Well, that's ahistorical. It's a historically white university. See, predominantly white leaves out the history of racial exclusion, <laughs> mm -hmm. right? right? And so, so, th so our young people are not getting the information. Historically, white says you couldn't come here if you weren't white. Mm -hmm. And Sorry. so then white kids get to see that their skin got them something. Their identity gets them a lot because then when you have the Black Student Union on a historically white college and university campus, white kids say things like, well, if we went and created our own organizations, that'd be unacceptable. Right. <laughs> yeah, um, I like went to, to one of those universities and I heard a lot of that. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, in, with regards, we're talking a lot about identity right now, and of course, on the flip side of that, of course, is the is a word that a lot of people consider to be too academic, and that is intersectionality. Now, that's defined as a framework for understanding how aspects of one's social and political identities might combine to create unique modes of discrimination. So you have a this mode of this, this you know, part of identity that's being discriminated against, this part of your identity that's being discriminated against, and they intertwine. Why must we understand this framework and incorporate it into our normal conversations to not only fully grasp how racism works in America, but also to fully and effectively strategize against it? I'll, you know, I'll start with you. Yeah, I think it's really important to understand what that really means. I think we've distorted that so much. I think it's an incredibly um, important reality that we have to understand the other isms. Um, but if we're not careful, then we'll, we'll ex 
explore and examine intersectionality through another ism called escapism, mm -hmm. right? So right. this is how I take the off-ramp to race and I can right. talk about gender or identity or religion or uh, status and, and those kinds of things. So I think it's critically important to understand how race intersects with all of those things, not independent realities. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, we see, you know, we have, of course, gender being one of those identities. We have, you know, sexual identity, a number of different ways that people can be discriminated against, Jackie. How and why is race so, you know, important still in our, in our lives? It is the principal organizing factor in this country's history and remains so today. Mm -hmm. In I Have a Dream and in the World House chapter of his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Dr. King mentioned the fierce urgency of now. Uh, so what is one lesson that cultivators of, and those perhaps unknowingly complicit in systemic racism, like we were talking about before, what is it that they must learn, uh, and Jackie, I'll start with you on this, with the fierce urgency of now to earnestly begin to eradicate systemic racism in America? Um, yeah, there are two areas where I think the urgency of now um, gets revealed, and those are in healthcare and law enforcement. And the reason for that is because they leave bodies behind, black and brown <laughs> bodies behind, mm -hmm. right? And so the act of, let's say, ima imagine this scene. Um, that you're, there's a restaurant, there's um, a white woman has her purse right here, and a younger African-American man is walking past, she grabs her purse and puts it up here. Okay, this act. Now when you get into what's motivating that act and the assumptions held, um, those are the same set of assumptions that get manifest in using a gun and experiencing fear um, through law enforcement um, and that results in medical actors not treating the person in front of them as a fully human being deserving of their care. Mm. And so um, now is about lives. The urgency of now um, is for people of color, a matter of life and death. And for white people, it is a matter of um, finding our humanity again. Mm. Yeah. Dina, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, if we don't act now, we are in a period of regression. Mm -hmm. And while we've made enormous progress, I think Manny Marable said, you know, my, my you know, worst nightmare has come true. We've made a lot of progress and nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. Our outcomes are wider now than they were at the time that Dr. King and others faced brutal terror so that we could have access so barriers would be removed. <laughs> Um, Dr. Sandy Darity and Dr. Keith Robinson uh, put out a, a stunning and um, disturbing report, what we get wrong about the racial wealth gap. Mm -hmm. And so home ownership won't close it. Uh, right. Higher education won't close it. All those things are incredibly important. But they are inadequate responses to these systemic inequities. Mm -hmm. The material consequences of those 346 years are glacial. Right. They're glacial. If we do not understand the nature of that, then the systems gap will be recreated by those things. Right. And I think it's life and death for white people because yeah. you can't lower the standards in a system for one group and think another group can operate optimally. Right. You know, while black women's babies are dying at two and a half to three times the rate of white women, white women in the United States babies are dying at rates greater than that of white women in other countries. Yeah. And so, um, so, there, so we have our gap here, but we're really sliding off the international stage when it comes to education and healthcare and overall well-being. So I think, I think the moral imperative isn't enough for, for white people. Mm -hmm. I think that white people need to know your lives are at stake in this as well. But Jackie, we see you know, maternal mortality is not the only area in which you know, essentially white life has become more and more endangered in this country. I mean, we've seen it. You know, then become the base of the drug problem with yeah. the opioid crisis. Right. Uh, and all of a sudden, of course, that changes you know, legal strategies all of a sudden. Right. Imagine that. Um, can you tell me a little bit about how much more needs to happen for essentially these white communities to get it? Or is racism 
or the, the, the preservation of that unearned advantage so appealing that they're willing to forgo essentially you know, their own longevity. Yeah. Well, I think that there's <laughs> enough evidence to suggest that the, the love of hate has, has been so significant and foundational um, for so many white people that they're willing to give up years of their lives to hold on to it. And that, yeah, so. Yeah, because I, we see areas, um, in, you know, not to pick on particular geographic areas at all, but you know, we see areas of the country that are, you know, essentially we hear all the time, the phrase is voting against their own interests. Right. Um, we, you know, we've heard that phrase you know, thrown at black folks a lot. Uh, we've heard it fr thrown at women in particular yeah. a lot but not white people as a group. Um, I'm trying to understand, you know, especially with the rise of white nationalism, uh, you know, in this last few years, what is it going to take for white people, and I'll direct this at both of you, to, have, to understand better that they are indeed having a racial experience every day in this country? I think more of these conversations, I think an examination of whiteness and what it means, um, you know, as, as Jackie was saying, um, when did people become white? You know, mm -hmm. because every one, when, when was whiteness created and then when did b people become white? Because um, so many Americans believe that um, there are biological differences between us and they're not. And so <laughs> we don't understand that this is this false construct, but it was right. institutionalized and emboldened and empowered in such a way that now we don't need the maliciousness that we needed anymore. Right. And then we have um, our diversity movement, which was important, but th that becomes the evidence then that see race isn't an issue, you know, because we've right. got this person and we've got that person. And so, um, so I think it's, it's really, really important to also understand white people aren't doing well. You know, we have twice as many poor white people on welfare in this country than we do African Americans right. or Hispanic Latinx people. Black people and Hispanic Latinx people are disproportionately poor. But when you're talking about on welfare, and just talking about meeting the federal poverty threshold, almost twice as many poor white people. Right. So poor white people aren't doing well. The thing is, is that they're not doing bad because they're white, but they are doing bad because of racism. Yes. And we That's have great. to get clear about that and we have to get fluent with that. How do we yeah. convey that to white people so that they can see that they've been used as a wedge uh, between other oppressed people and, and uh, white people who are doing really well and they get just a little something for it. In this respect, Jackie, I mean, that we see some politicians uh, primarily focusing on the class argument, perhaps in, a, in an effort to gain the attention of, 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 of electorates like that. Right. How effective is that as an argument, uh, either politically or you know, in terms of uh, strategizing for, for actual change? Well, I think it's, um, <laughs> we have to, we have to talk about class, but we can never just talk about class. Mm -hmm. uh, Dina has all referred to numerous statistics that are, they're not about class. It is about race. You, you strip away the um, class divides at, these school, at our school boards where we're looking at um, how our students are performing and how they are experiencing their education, and you find clear delineation, and it's a long excuse me, along race lines. Right. Um, so, uh, so, that, so then talking about only class from a political stage um, is, it, it reveals blinders and perhaps they're intentional blinders because there's an assumption about we the people and how we will respond to um, saying the word race. I mean, you think about Obama's <laughs> presidency and the care that man had to take with how he spoke, mm -hmm. um, and, and I know that many uh, white people who engage in or, or try to engage in anti-racist work, like we are in front of large numbers of white people, and when we just say the word race, or people white. are feeling attacked. <laughs> you mean you you're calling me a racist, race. what do you mean? And yeah. people are feeling attacked. White yeah. privilege, and oh my God. What white privilege Can't are you talking about? I'm poor. So I, so I want to say that yeah. to say, clearly, we the people do have strong responses, yeah. and so there's a political cost. Uh, but there's also a political gain, yeah. I believe, by the honesty, the integrity mm -hmm. of, of a leader who can speak truth. 
There's got to still be something valuable about that to us. That obviously the the modes for leadership are different now, uh, and a large part of you know large reason why is technology. Mm -hmm. uh, we are communicating in a lot of different ways, and frankly, propaganda gets issued in a lot of different ways. Um, they have a lot more convenient avenues these days. Dina, how how does that play into strategizing to combat this problem? Well, I think it could be a very powerful tool, but I think we have to learn first. We've ha we have a lot of conversations without education and information. Right. And then it becomes our experience, our opinion. You know, a lot of the sort of open mic just come and weigh in, I think, lends to the confusion. Uh, my minister said something after attending a workshop about our history. He said, you know, an organized lie is more powerful than a disorganized truth. And if we don't organize the truth and then say that together, then we might end up working in, in ways that counter each other. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, if, if some of our, you know, people in our community, especially in the African-American community, see racism and racism as bigotry and, mm -hmm. and the N-word, and other people think it's about our curriculum and how people make decisions about a, aggressive health care decisions, mm -hmm. then we're not even talking about the same thing. And, and, we're, and we're black. Right. So we need to get on the same page. We need to invest that time in understanding and studying this and then use technology as a way to communicate with what Dr. Jim Johnson says, mind-numbing consistency. Mm -hmm. That's great. Jackie, um, you know, so often, though, you know, we get distracted from that conversation um, because we're wrapped in conversations about, well, did this person get called a racist or so on and so forth. <laughs> Uh, how has that dynamic shifted towards that, you know, towards sort of pr prioritizing white feelings over black outcomes? Oh, yeah. Well, it does prioritize white feelings over black outcomes. It mm -hmm. happens all the time, every day. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's exactly what it does. I have no, there is no, I can't twist that some other way. It, it, <laughs> that is what it is. That's the truth. Yeah. Um, and it's happening all over the place. In fact, you know, before we came on, we were talking about how we try to approach different groups when we're facing, you know, controversial um, things that occurred in the community. And we talked about how we are so careful with the language that we use, but we're really clear with the, the truth of the impact, the truth of the history that shaped it, but we try not to use terminology that's just going to shut people off on the front end. So I, I think that's okay to be careful with the terminology, right? Because I, I can articulate that white people are conferred um, unfair advantage from, from the very first laws passed at this nation up through this present moment, right? Because the, the, those whose interests and perspectives shape all of our laws is that of heterosexual Christian white men. Mm -hmm. Right, and and that's just the norm of law, and um, and so I can say that, and mm -hmm. that's a truth, right? Yes. Or I could say it that white supremacy is built in our laws, and then people don't listen to me. So, <laughs> right? So, but but I'm going to say the first, right? I'm right. not going to leave that out. It, that, right. So that's the point. Like to try to use terminology that's not going to shut that off. I tell my students sometimes you want to shut it off and. Just know that that's what you're doing, right? <laughs> but if we want to dig in and try to work together um, and engage in a conversation, then let then do that. You know, I I can I can do that in a way that's going to root us in history and that's going to challenge us. And you know, I don't have to call you a racist to do it, right? Even if we are, because the structures that we live in make us that way. Last thing, very quickly, how essential is it that we have anti-racist leaders. And I mean that in a very specific, specifically defined way. I mean, Ibram X. Kendi has you know, come out with his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. So if you're not under understanding what I'm talking about, there's a manual now. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> I would highly recommend that you read that book. But can you tell me a little bit about you know, why it's essential, very quickly, that we have anti-racist leaders, Dina? Well, I think an anti-racist leaders brings a sort of um, race analysis into the work that they do. I mean, I, I, I'm on the school board in, in Greensboro, North Carolina. I've been on the school board for 18 years. And without this anti-racist framework, I wouldn't even ask the right questions. 
Mm. I wouldn't know to, to ask the questions, to get to the information that dispels some of the initiatives and programs that we're doing that have been ineffective, that have maintained a racial gap for decades. And so I think it's critically important yep. that our leaders bring that sort of anti-racist, structural racism yep. lens, critical race theorist lens to the work that we do because we're, we're making decisions and we're influencing policy. Indeed. I think it's really useful as well because it, it keeps us from getting sidetracked and helps you be really focused mm -hmm. on what are the results um, of that policy? Mm -hmm. you know, what are they? And, and if we know they're, they're really racist because they're unequal along race lines, that's racist. So let's consider other policies that are not. And so it, it, I, I find it a really useful way to, to help us not to go off on different tangents and to really stay focused on the goal, which is finally becoming a people, a nation that is anti-racist. Can you even imagine it? Yes, I can imagine a lot. So yes, I can. And I think as long as we can continue to imagine it, and, and try to imagine it, then that's, uh, that's the first step towards the goal. Jackie, Dina, really appreciate you joining us today. Thank Jamil, you. thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I want to remind everyone here and watching online that uh, at the end of each conversation, uh, we, we want to invite uh, all of you to join us in taking a listen to others who are in our watch party uh, for their thoughts. And without further ado, we're gonna go right to that watch party. Hey Charles, can you take it away? Uh, one thing struck me when I, uh, when I heard the conversation, I I've always heard people tell me, get over it. And not only does it make me mad, but it also makes me think that you don't see me and you don't recognize my history. I, I wonder when you heard some of this wonderful discussion, uh, Elaine, what, what, what struck you when you heard it? Yeah, there were a couple things that stood out to me. I think the first one uh, was about whiteness being invisible mm -hmm. and wiping that away from it and then bringing in the conversation about intersectionality because I do think it's so easy for us, um, like for women, to grasp on to, hey, we're feminists and we're going to band together or we're people with disabilities and we're going to fight for that. But you don't peel back the layers and, and figure out that there's race behind all of that. And that undergirds all of the things that are becoming those isms. So I do think that we need to have a collective conversation about it. But it struck me as, um, you know, the reminder not to forget that race is part of that conversation about intersectionality. Good. I think as a white person in this conversation, um, you ended on race is a reality. And I think Jackie's point of there is a discomfort of even saying the word race or racism. And if we can't get past starting, I mean, it's the elephant in the room, right? If we can't use those words, we're not going to make progress. And I think um, a lot of times you'll have a discussion and they're like, well, I'm not racist. And to, to your opening comments, I think if we can get people to engage on a level of not being concerned about whether someone's calling them racist or not mm -hmm. and getting them to an anti-racist, that's, that's the bridge that the, the gap I think we're in that needs to be crossed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, the thing that struck me that, that Dean had mentioned was 87% of, of our history, of written history in this country, um, and you think about what a hurdle that is to climb, uh, and just how much it's become institutionalized, and when you think about it in that frame of reference that you're talking about the vast majority of, of history in this country, uh, it's not really that surprising that, that we're still having such a hard time overcoming it. But uh, to your point, to me, I mean, I think it really is how do you how do you take a stance of becoming an, an anti-racist and acknowledging our privilege and and really moving forward from there in a way that's that's more inclusive for everyone. Thanks, Alex. Yeah, you know, I think um, what was really interesting again what Dina was saying about you know white um, being invisible and also what's in our education system today and how that's also kind of being erased and it's it's being whitewashed in that sense and. Even as an Asian American, right, you see racism in different levels, even within the Asian community. And I think there's a self-awareness that we all need to bring to the table to, to have that discussion about being an anti-racist. We all have to put it on the table and say, hey, what are our views and how are we looking at things? Mm -hmm. And are we trying to swipe things under the table and just make it like, oh, it's not racist? And I think that's really key, especially for youth and kids, that this recognition happens earlier. You see it's different with elders and adults, right? That conversation has to happen, but the adults teach the kids. And it's really important that these concepts really get put into the, to the children as well. Randall? Yeah. 
So I think we're quickly losing a demographic in this society, particularly young black males. Uh, our culture mentor have been for years young black males, and they're starting to become really disenfranchised with a system that they're realizing is set up for them to fail. They're undereducated, underhoused, undercared for in the healthcare system, at the same time being over-policed and over-criminalized. They're starting to realize it earlier and earlier and earlier, and uh, we're starting to lose them as a society. Hey, what do you guys think about that comment about the love of hate? Yeah. How do we get over that? that concept because it's in both both demographics in some respects any thoughts yeah i think that's a tough one i mean uh there's it, it's it's the love of hate and you're not wanting to give away from it i think we have to go back to the first word and that it's the love mm -hmm. and i think we we need to start there everyone every human has that desire for love um, of being of feeling self-worth and i think if we start there we can try to sort of move that needle but um it's 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 going to be tough and i think look um love of love right yeah. i mean yeah. so why not have that i mean i think a lot of it also has to do with ego you know, are we willing to accept, you know, hate comes from having ego. If you look at the core tenets of what hate is, it's an ego, I'm better than you, or I'm better than this, or this is my point of view. Love is about compassion, about respecting the other point of view. And I think that's what we really need to start looking at is, how do you have the love of love, right? I mean, it's, it's a great quote from Dr. King, right? I mean, darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. And hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. With one word, how do we, how do we drive out? Drawing the love of hate. Um, courage. One word. I don't have one word, but I have a, a couple of words. Uh, we're teaching it. We're passing it from one generation to the next. Love and hate are strong emotions, and I believe they're being taught from one generation to the next. So I only have one word, but that's one phrase I like to talk. One word. I, I think empathy. Empathy is, is really the one that I would think about. And it's not, it's empathetic love if you can walk in someone else's shoes. Hey, Jamil, uh, we have a lot of notes here. We have a great discussion. It was a great discussion we just had. Uh, we are, we're going to continue our discussion. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to you for the uh, next conversation. Thank you for joining Beloved Community Talks. We hope you were inspired by these courageous conversations. The King Center and our partners at Civic Dinners invite you to join us in bridging the racial divide in our nation by hosting your own courageous conversation. Help us reach our goal of 1,000 conversations across the nation. To learn more, visit us on the web at BelovedCommunityTalks.org. This Beloved Community Talks is made possible by our sponsors, Procter & Gamble and the NFL. Together, we can bridge the racial divide to build Dr. King's dream of the beloved community. Join the King Center and our partner, Civic Dinners, to learn how to host your own beloved community talks in your very own communities.